Good morning. This morning our psalm is Psalm 130. <clears throat> Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there's forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. More than those who watch for the morning. O oh, Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all of its iniquities. If you'll join me in prayer, may the word of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. This morning's psalm reminded me of a monk story. I know it's been a while since I last shared one of those. So, this one is just from an anonymous monk from Rome. And the story is about this, there's this monk from Rome that settles in Egypt. And while he's there, um, he's, he's, he's been there a while. He has gotten kind of famous in the region, and, but now he's older. He's a little sick. There's a priest that checks in on him just to make sure everything's okay. And he's got a servant to take care of him. And it's under these circumstances that a local Egyptian monk hears about him and wants to go meet this famous monk from Rome. So he goes all the way out there. He finally meets this guy. And when the monk from Rome opens the door, lo and behold, he's wearing a really nice robe. Now, as you know, monks are not famed for having really nice things. And as a matter of fact, the Egyptian monk had assumed that this famous Roman monk would be really, really hardcore. But here he is in a nice robe. And as he goes inside his little house, he sees, oh my gosh, this guy's got a servant. He's got a bed. He's got a bed with really nice sheets. He's even got a pillow. And it's, it's a little much. He's disappointed. He expected more. But he, he has dinner with the, the Roman monk, and, you know, even during dinner, the Roman monk has wine with it. And he says, oh, you know, it's for my condition. I need a little bit of wine. And the Egyptian monk's inwardly just like, sure. Sure, 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 whatever, whatever you say. But he has dinner with them. They say some psalms. They go to bed. And the next morning, the Egyptian monk, he leaves. He's leaving. He's disappointed. This has not at all been what he hoped for. But he tells the Roman monk, hey, say a prayer for me. And he starts leaving. And the Roman monk sees him going and knows, all right, I have not done right. That guy came here for some inspiration. And he's leaving and he's clearly disappointed. So he calls him back. He says, come back. Let's, let's learn a little about each other. Where are you from? What was life like before you were a the Egyptian monk says, well, you know, I was a peasant. I was a peasant. I didn't have much. I worked in the fields. I slept in the fields. I was so poor. Um, that was my life before I was a monk. And the Roman monk says, wow, that, you had a hard life. I, I can't imagine what that was like. Mine was really different. I am... Actually, I was one of the friends of the emperor, and I had a mansion that was giant, and I had hundreds of slaves to do whatever I wanted them to do. My table had golden plates with anything I wanted on them. I had everything you could imagine, and, um, you know, I've, I've given up a lot. I went from the, the feasts to the, just this little... A little bit of wine and some vegetables. I, I only have one servant now to help take care of me. Uh, I really have given up a lot, but I just wanted to explain my weakness to you, where I'm from, and 
why I am the way I am, since I could tell it bothered you. And the, the Egyptian monk responds, Woe to me, for after so much hardship in this world, I have found ease. And what I did not have before, I now possess. While after so great ease, you have come to humility and poverty. And after that, he, he goes home and he gets it. He gets it. And the two of them actually become friends and visit each other and learn from each other. Um, I guess that story reminded me, or that this psalm reminded me of that story because it's just, the, the way it starts out, out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. In the story about the monks, there was uh, just a real knowledge that neither of these monks really knew what the other one had been through, why they were the way they were. Uh, the one monk, he had been through some tough stuff to get where he is. And then the other monk, um, he had, had it nice and had to give up a lot to be where it is. Neither of them could fully understand what the other had been through and what they had to give up, the depths that they hit in their journey. And that's, that's kind of the way pain is. I mean, we can't really know what someone else has gone through, even in this time where we're all kind of experiencing, in a big way, a really similar pain. We can't imagine what it feels like for other people. And there's so many other things that this is impacting. We cannot fathom the individual pains that each person has today. But at the same time, while the psalmist uses I cry to you, this individual language of an unknowable pain, a psalm is usually said by a community, a group of people that come together. Like even this morning, we're, we're saying it together. Um, it's sung together, they're chanted together. And I think there's something in that, you know, even with all of our individual pain, our unknowable pain, we come together in solidarity, not knowing what one another have been through, but still being there for each other, still being able to share that burden by coming together. And as the psalm progresses, the psalmist you know, he's getting ready to complain, right? Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. I'm getting geared up because I know if I had some trouble stuff, the way I approach things is typically if things aren't the way I want them and I'm going to complain, it's going to be from a place of what I'm owed. What am I owed? Because let's face it, I'm pretty great. Here's the things that I deserve. And if I get the things that I deserve, then I'll be happy. So when, when life feels like it's falling way short of what I am owed, that's when I've got a problem. That's, that's when I want to go to God and say, hey, God, what's the deal? I'm pretty great and things aren't working out for me. Um, but that's the opposite of what we see in the psalm. Here, instead of following it up with, hey, I'm pretty great, you probably owe me some stuff, the psalmist starts saying, Lord, if you should mark iniquities, who could stand? But there's forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. He's not coming from a place of what is owed to him. He knows nothing is owed to him. I, I sometimes wonder, because I think, I think that's a rare, rare position to take. Instead of asking for something, like a lawyer, here's what I'm owed, and here's how you ought to give it to me. This is someone who is coming to God as a child, asking their father for something. And why is that so hard for us? Um, Leslie Newbigin, he's this, this missionary that spent a lot of time in India, and then he came back over to the West, and I think he's from England, and he started writing about missions here. Because in all of his experience in India, you know, people knew India is very different. We're going to have to do a lot of work on culture. We have to understand what things are like for these people, what, what their world is, how they talk, how they think, so that we can communicate with them effectively. And then he comes back over here and 
he didn't find that missions were very much like that. Everyone kind of assumed more or less that we know. Since we live in the West, we know what it means to be a missionary in the West. We all kind of more or less get it. And he said, whoa, we ought to do some research here because just because we've lived here and this, it's been Christian for so long does not mean it's just going to go on that way forever. Culture changes. Things change, and we have to keep understanding the world, how people think, where people are at, so we can engage with them well, so we can talk to them and expect they're going to understand what we're saying. Um, and he, during one of his big explorations of Western culture, one thing I thought was fascinating is the way he considered human rights as a distinctly Western construction, something that has been uh, exported all over the world from our culture, but one that is singularly unique. The way that there are certain things that we are owed by sheer nature of them being our rights. Uh, they're guaranteed by our government. That's who we expect to step in if we are not given those things. Uh, meanwhile, even if you were to stay in Western culture and go back to, say, the Middle Ages, it would have been unthinkable. It would have been bizarre. In a big way, people assumed that what was... It, it, things were a network of you perform something for someone and then you get something. If, if there's a lord, you serve your lord, you give them some of your crops and, and money, and then you deserve their protection. It's this uh, duties along with rights. Meanwhile, that's, that's just different. To have sheer human rights that we are owed changes the way we think. Now, I don't mean to propose that human rights are a bad thing. By no means. By no means. And I don't think that's what he was saying either. But I think he was suggesting that the way that we frame um, these philosophical concepts that we've invented says a lot about us, how we think, how we act. Um, while human rights have done a lot for a lot of people, maybe it does make it a little harder for us to approach God from a sheer place of, of not of what we're owed, but just in sheer supplication, asking God for something that we know we are not owed. Uh, ironically, uh, the same guy, Leslie Newbigin, discussed how one of the ways to get the real gospel, even though we are all of us are in a culture, and our our understanding of the faith will always be um, partially changed by the culture, but as we speak across cultures, we can start to understand the gospel better because we'll see how other people heard it, the things that they heard that we couldn't hear. And that exactly, this psalmist... Um, speaking from a very different culture a long, long time ago, I think has something to offer us Westerners today, just in posture, not, not in what we're owed, not in legalese, but in just saying, God, I come before you, be not because I'm owed anything at all. Everything you've given me is a gift, but I still need your help. Um, that's humility. It's beautiful. And then... As he progresses, here's the part I hate. I hate this part, and you will too. I know it. <laughs> because it's waiting. Waiting is the worst. Nobody likes that. I think that's a fair statement. Just the other day, I realized how much I hated it. When I was trying to record this, actually, uh, I had, I thought I had, I know I own a tripod. And I was going to set it up so I could record better. But I couldn't find it. It's somewhere in the closet. I thought I took everything out, and it wasn't there. It wasn't there. And I was freaking right on out. You can ask my wife sometimes. She had to witness it. It was not, not good. <laughs> and lo and behold, it wasn't there. It wasn't there. But then after I was done, I kind of sat back and I realized, yikes. Yikes. I... I mean, clearly I figured it out with, without the tripod, so it wasn't that big a deal. But even just looking for it while I thought it was still there, that was wildly frustrating. I did not have the patience for that. And waiting takes patience. Um, but at the same time, I think 
here the, the psalmist has a different kind of, of waiting. It's not just waiting. It's not just having patience. It's waiting in hope. Waiting in hope. Uh, and that is a hope that is not, I hope God does something, but knowing knowing that God will do something, waiting in hope that it will come sooner rather than later because there's no question that God will make things right. That's a fact. It's just waiting in the hope that it comes now. And maybe that is a, a unique difference from my experience looking for that tripod because there was hope involved there too, but that was a different hope. That was the hope, I hope I didn't leave that at the church because I can't go get it now. <laughs> so, and sure enough, I'm pretty sure I did. But this is this hope, this is a hope that is not just built on, you know, maybe, maybe I have the tripod, maybe I don't, maybe this will happen, maybe it won't. It's a hope that is founded in knowledge that it will come. And then here at the end, it is he who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. That is the knowledge that the psalmist has, that he can just rest in. That is how he can hope well, hope not in fear, but wait in hope and in knowledge that God will redeem everything. God will redeem Israel from all of its iniquities. Um, and there is some, some discussion about what is meant in the Bible when you see the word Israel. Some people are very much of the mindset that it's, it should be taken as a historical entity. Israel referred to a very specific people in a very specific place, and that's how it should be understood. You can draw inferences from that, but you ought to change what it means. Israel is a specific people in a specific place. Uh, that's one school of thought. Um, another school of thought is kind of treating Israel. This one's less common, but it's still out there. Uh, the thought that Israel is not just Israel then, it's Israel today. Um, referring to the nation that exists today as Israel, which, I mean, Israel was off the map for over a thousand years, whether you see that as... Uh, it, whether you see continuity between those two nations or whether they're completely different things, I guess if, if you're of that party, you would say that is still Israel. Um, I don't know about that one either. Honestly, my favorite way to think about the word Israel isn't to think about a nation somewhere across the earth. It isn't to think about a group of people that existed somewhere else at some other time. It's to think Israel as, as God's people as those who wait and listen for God to speak. I mean, that's, that's what I do when I read my Bible. I don't read the Bible because I just think, wow, I'd really like to hear about some historical people that lived and died in a time long ago. Um, no, I, I read the Bible because God is speaking to me today, now, through the Bible even though it was written by all kinds of different people a long, long time ago, God still speaks to me through those scriptures. Um, and that's, that interpretation of the word is among the earliest interpretations that you'll find in, in the very beginning of Christianity. So I think it's got some real power to it. I do. And I think just leaving it like that it is God who will redeem his people from all their iniquities. That, that is a good, good word. So, wherever you are this week, whatever you're dealing with, whether you are afraid because of coronavirus, whether you are just bored out of your skull because you've been trapped inside so long, whether you are dealing with something totally different that I couldn't fathom. I hope you can hear, you can, you can come here before God in total humility, knowing you, you are owed nothing, but just to ask, to ask humbly, God, make things right, make things right. So I'm gonna be right here waiting 
in hope and in faith that you will. Amen. Let's finish worship this morning by affirming our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.